February 17, 2001, a five-year-old Khadija went to school. Khadija went to school to study just like any other day. But unfortunately, on this particular day, Khadija was left alone in the classroom because she had to stay behind and finish her classwork. Unknown to Khadija, there was a man that was waiting for a moment so that he can have a go at her. And once he, that opportunity came, the man put Khadija on the table and raped her several times. Khadija was later on found that day in the pool of her own blood. Khadija's life will never, ever be the same. Or is it Ibrahim, who is a 12-year-old boy, who came in search of a greener pasture, but ended up at the steps or at the doorstep of a graveyard where he puts his head to rest. And on this day, unfortunately, a 50-year-old man found him and said to him, come and share a tent with me. And Ibrahim thought at that moment that he had found ease and relief. Little did he know that this man was going to abuse him. The 50-year-old man abused Ibrahim several times. Ibrahim screamed until he could scream no more. Or is it little Amina, a four-year-old girl with sickle cell? who lived under the same room as her mom and her father, and a man called Kawu, who is the father's friend. But Kawu, unfortunately, continuously raped Amina, and Amina had fistula. And the father said to the mother to drop the case because the mother was doing anything that she could to get justice for Amina. But the father said to her, if you continue to push, I will divorce you. And as I speak to you today, the mother is divorced and Amina lives with her mom in that terrible condition. She has fistula as a result of Kawu's abuse. You know, I know that we all are here and you have heard the stories and some of you are so emotional. But um, what is very surprising to me is some of us beyond this moment, we just will not care anymore. And if we don't care, then we are then causing, or we are then going into a global pandemic. That is if we haven't gone into a global pandemic. You know, we sit down here and think that this gender-based violence only affects the survivors and their families, but no, it doesn't. Because the pandemic of gender-based violence is becoming a global phenomenon and not just globally it's becoming and increasingly becoming a Nigeria phenomenon and a northern Nigeria phenomenon I will give you now some statistics and um, the national statistics and then we'll talk briefly about the global statistics of gender-based violence it is said nationally that three out of ten women before the age of 15 must have experienced one form of gender-based violence before the age 15, meaning 33% of women. However, in the Northwest and Northeast, that number has increased by 7%, meaning 39 to 40% of women before the age of 15 must have experienced one form of gender-based violence or another. While globally, it is said 33% of women globally have experienced one form of gender-based violence, not 33, 35% of women have experienced a form, one form of gender-based violence. So if we look and I stop and I look at the room that we are in today, it means that more than half of us might have experienced one form of gender-based violence, unfortunately and sadly. And looking at the numbers, you would wonder, like, what are the causes of gender-based violence? And I will brush through them because of time. And I would like to describe this using a tree, you know, and um, I will start with the roots. What are the root causes of gender-based violence? Why do we have them? What, what are the causes? So I will just simply begin by saying that some of the root causes are um, our cultural dispensation, our attitude towards gender discrimination, the gender roles that we ascribe to boys and girls, 
and total disrespect for women, I will say. And then I will have, um, I will talk about the weather and the temperature, that those things that aid or that fuel gender-based violence. And I will say that poverty is one, broken system, lack of respect for human rights, all these things are things that fuel the root causes, you know, they, they make the roots stronger and uh, makes it almost impossible for us to stop or end gender-based violence against women or young girls. And then we have the branches. The branches are the different types of gender-based violence. You know, we have the physical abuse, we have the psycho psychological, we have um, child marriage, we have FGM, female genital mutilation, and then we have the leaves now. Like the leaves are the fruits, like what then, what are the outcomes of, um, of gender-based violence? I would say one is STD, STDs, unwanted pregnancies, and then now that we are seeing the way that things are going, it also results to death, unfortunately. So you see, these issues are very, very serious issues. And we might just sit down here and say, you know what, what can I do? I can't do anything about it. But I want you to stop and to think that this affects the most vulnerable groups of people, meaning that I am not safe. You are not safe. Nobody is safe. Because looking back at Khadija's story, Khadija was in school when it happened. We look at the story of Amina. Amina was at home, living under the same room, roof with her father and mother. And so we are not free from this. The, the earlier we begin to act, the better for us, so we can have a better future for our young ones and even for ourselves. Now I have, talken, I have spoken about um, the causes or contributing factors to gender-based violence. I would like to quickly talk about some of the challenges because I know some of you here have tried to journey through the prevention and mitigation or even responding to gender-based violence. But these are some of the challenges that we face. You know, we have one, we have weak data, we have low or weak implementation of laws because yes a lot of states in the northern nigeria all they are upcoming you know have passed a lot of laws against um gender-based violence and whatnot but we have very low implementation rate and what that cause is is that the perpetrators tend they tend to hide behind the cracks because we have low rates of implementation we also have law uh, we also have um lack of trust in the in the system, I would say, you know, the systems are broken. We don't, people don't even trust the system. So why even seek for help if I know that I'm getting nothing out of it? We have um, close to zero coordination of um, GBV actors. You know, everybody is working in silos. We have NGOs working. We have um, development partners working, but there's no synergy at all. So if there's no synergy, there's clearly no um, referral pathway, like what when it happens, where do I go beyond the police station and just for instance. So that is also a problem. And then we also have the problem of not involving the people that we see are perpetrating this GBV, which are the men and the boys. We, we, don't, um, we don't engage them when we're trying to bring a halt or a stop or an end to gender-based violence. So now that you have heard, I have told you stories, I have told you, I've given you statistics, I have given you challenges, and I've given you contributing factors to gender-based violence, I would just like to pause here. And I will speak to your conscience. And I will say what I have said before, that a lot of you will leave this space and not even care beyond this point. And I believe that now is the time and now is the place where we can come collectively and use our voices to end gender-based violence. We all have a role and that is why I am here today. How can we use our voices collectively as one to end or help prevent or mitigate gender-based violence? And I will start by saying that, as we know, GBV or gender-based violence is not caused as a result of only one factor. It is caused as a result of multiple factors. So if you want to go through this journey 
if you want to help or use your voice to end this gender-based violence, you have to use a multi-sectoral approach, meaning every and each and every one of us must be part of it. The police, ha the police must be part of it. We have the, the, the health or the medical doctors must be part of the journey. The young people, the traditional rulers, the teachers in school, everybody must be part of this journey. And then how then can we use our voices collectively? And I will tell you the first thing that we need to do is to have the correct information. When you have the correct information about gender-based violence and harmful traditional practices, what you will do is you will educate your daughters, you will educate your sisters, girls in school, and empower them. Once they have that tool, believe me, that is the first step, or that's the, that's the first thing that you will do to journey through the prevention and um, mitigation and even response to gender-based violence. You know, Having said that, Another thing that you can do collectively is collective advocacy, because once you have the information, you can come as a coalition, you come together and advocate for many things. I have told you the challenges. You can advocate for, for instance, for implementation of laws. Like why do we have delays and convictions? You know, why do we have delays sometimes in even passing some of these laws? Why do we have zero data? Why do we have data everywhere? You can advocate for some of these things, you know, when you come collectively. And I tell people how then some some of you will question or will be wondering how can you do this? I say a lot of us have this device called mobile phones. You know, a lot of us use it for the right reason. Some don't, but I will tell you, you can start a movement by just using your Androids, your, your Apple phones or any device that you have. You can start collectively and talk about these issues. Believe me, when you come together and talk about these issues, the right audience will listen to you. And I like to give this example. I am talking here on the stage. Just assume that I start to scream. You know, I know a lot of you will want to know why is she screaming? What is she what what is wrong with her you know and um yes i would get that reaction but imagine if 10 of us should come on the stage and we begin to scream i'm sure the people not only in this hall even those walking outside we want to will want to know why we are screaming and would like to hear and understand why and this is what collective voice does you know when you come together the audience that you are seeking their attention will definitely begin to respond to you and it will also increase funding for instance if you are if you're looking for funding and you're you want to address some of these issues in your communities in your you know people would will be will become interested in what you're doing and it will also put the government, you know, on their toes, you know, the issues of gender-based violence will be brought to the political top, you know, and um, they will want to begin to know how to support in the, in, the, in the ending or eradication of any form of discrimination against women. And I tell people, you know, once the government is in and they begin to understand that gender-based violence also affect the social and the economic cost of a country, you know, they will begin to want to know how to support in ending this. And um, on this note, I know I have um, only 18 minutes to finish this. I would like to challenge you all here today. And I will say this, do not wait because there is never a right time. You have to start now and you have to challenge yourself and pledge that you will do something in your little corner. You start from your little corner and then you join forces to help the most vulnerable groups of people, our young girls, our boys, and even us. Nobody is free from this. It is a pandemic and it is eating our society, particularly in Northern Nigeria.